it only took me a week and I finally got there. Welcome to the Smackdown Review. I'm Michael Hanford from What Culture. I'm joined by Michael Sidrick from What Culture to discuss everything that happened on Friday's super dramatic edition of Smackdown. And I'm not going to do Wilborn's intro, Sidge, and I can tell by that face you want to get into this right away. What were your broad overarching thoughts of a historic edition of the Blue Brand? Well, stick around for the main event, kids. Uh, it's the one thing I'm really wanting to talk about. Uh-huh. I do want to point out that various issues with the professional wrestling on the show. Yeah. Okay. And nobody does, but we'll get to it. You know, I'm going to make a broad point first. Yeah. Before, you know, what I would consider quite glaring examples. Like, WWE, they get such a free ride. I'm convinced people just watch... Uh, phone in the hand. Uh, uh, phone in the hand. Uh, it's, uh, uh, phone in the hand. That is me, but SmackDown's on my phone and uh, there's my kids. Yes. Yeah. Like, some of the wrestling is just piss poor on these TV shows. <laughs> like, actually piss poor. Yeah. Like, we got opposite ends of the piss poor extreme. I mean, there's piss poor on one end and there's a different kind of piss poor on the other. But I, those uh, opposite extremes were met. Like, and then I go online <laughs> and I go, right, okay, <laughs> okay. I'm going to check out this review and I'll read this other review, and maybe I'll read the other review as well. No one mentions this. Eight out of ten, great show. It's like you and Wilborn are doing the writing. It's why? No, oh, I've caught straight there. I'm finding my notes. A terrible X Factor. Okay. A sloppy 619. And was that? Yeah, Because they were literally yeah. in the first match. It's just... It's fair, though, otherwise good. This, it just... They, I don't understand why they're the market leader. Mm. They should be the measuring stick against which... All else is judged. And some of the rest was just, it's rubbish. True. I, like, I don't disagree. But is it not just because they nail the absolute important things? Like the show opening with The Rock getting out of a pickup truck. More of that's come later. Yeah, I guess. It's just that I find it annoying. And it just feels like no one's, or very few people, are watching these shows intently. And when there's the attitude of, ah, it's only the wrestling, which, yeah. you know... You propagate. Fair. Yeah. Well, what am I watching it for? I mean, I'm watching this episode specifically and exclusively for The Rock. But, you know, it's just, it's no wonder these crowds are dead. They're watching absolutely flimsy action. It's an action adventure thrill ride. You're half right. And we start that thrill ride with uh, Kevin Owens versus Dominic Mysterio in a qualifier for the Elimination Chamber spot. Did this need to go 14 minutes? Uh, no, God, no. Um, Kevin Owens enters and then Dominic does. He's got a microphone in hand. He can't get the words out because of all the heat in the building. Hey, Die Jack! No. <laughs> Von Wagner wasn't there, but I wish he was. No, wait there, guys. What you got? I don't know. I don't know what I've got anymore. Dynasty Maker! <laughs> what? Because like, he was so over? That's just that I'm, I'm basically saying they press buttons to make noise. Oh, I get you right. So right. this is a demonstration of me pressing a button to make, you know, noise X. Dynasty Maker! <laughs> yeah, Mysterio couldn't get the words out because of all the heat in the building. Real cheers. And he said that Rhea Ripley's going to retain the women's title, Judgment Day are going to keep the tag titles, and he's going to complete the sweep while winning the Elimination Chamber and going to WrestleMania. Uh, Kevin Owens takes over straight away. Um, Wade Barrett calls Dominic the greatest Mysterio in wrestling history, which she would then disprove over the next 10 to 12 minutes. Um, Owens is just in total control. Dominic manages to get a clothesline and they go out to the floor, but Kevin Owens takes over again, throws Dominic into the steps. Uh, this is quite a nice bit. Our truth appears at ringside completely out of nowhere. Like, there's been no reaction to his arrival, so I assume they've like snuck him into that crowd at the side. So Owens is just a surprise. And in that extremely clever uh, distraction, Owens is like, what are you doing here? And uh, Dominic hits like a basement drop kick. That takes us to a break, and we obviously know truth there as we come back. Owens fights out of a chin lock. Uh, as they're coming back from the ad breaks, hits his um, like a running back splash on the floor, throws him back in, hits the cannonball splash in the corner and a frog splash, but still only gets two. That's a pretty hot near fall. Um, Dom- that near fall was not bad. Yeah. And I just think nobody would have expected Dominic to have that sort of fight within him. The frog splash seems to empower Dominic, presumably because he's in... Re- it's like the similar to Omega kicking out a one from Ibushi's moves, isn't it? Like... So he kicks out, he gets back in control. Crap that's just he crap hits, pattern, that's what it is. He hits, speaking of crap, he hits an absolutely risible X Factor. Just terrible. He's, he's not he good. Gently places Owens to the floor. Um, they're both like countering, trying to get the three amigos. 
Uh, Dominic manages to get there first, goes for a frog splash, but he misses. Uh, Owens gets up for a swan on that, gets another two count. Again, the fans seem to think Dominic was beat. Um, Owens goes for the stunner, catches the leg. Dominic hits him with a super kick onto the ropes, into the position for a... Uh, Six one nine, like what? it's more like a two one eight. <laughs> it was just all in slow motion. This, at which point Owens looks beat. Uh, Dominic leans over and asks R Truth for a chair. R Truth says he doesn't really need it; he can beat him by his own. Dominic says, "Look, look, you're in the judgment day. Get a chair." So Truth says, "All right, yeah." He sort of likes that like endorsement. Goes and gets a chair. But he sits on it. He doesn't give him it as a weapon. He just thinks Dominic wants him to have a front row seat. You get the miscommunication there. In that time, Owens is able to hit a pop-up power bomb, gets the one, two, three. He's off to Elimination Chamber. What do you, do you know think what, of this? Do you know what I hate about you? About me? It's like, you just... You, everything you say about the Fed, your beloved Fed, is just facetious. Incredibly facetious. You love it, but you don't... How can you like this? Well, it's... But there's a lot of different ways to like things. Yeah, I, I can like it and think it's pretty silly. I can like, I can, I, I keep talking about it. It's always going to end up with awesome truth. That's right. My argument for that being on WrestleMania is only about there being a bit of range on that card. Like, I want this to be silly. I want our truth here appearing out of nowhere. The distractions to be nonsensical and like our truth gets a chair, but not to use a weapon. Like, isn't that the first time our truth employed real logic in all of wrestling? A chair is to be sat on, not to be swung. Oh God, don't make us don't appeal to my pedantry. That's fair. No, well, I like this. this partly this, because this it's match is absolutely terrible. It, it, it was so, it was, I mean, it was 40 minutes, so it was long. It's part of this just crime wave of overlong matches for which people should be jailed. The yeah. agents, the wrestlers, Levesque. 14 minutes with like two near falls that I was like, ah. That's a noise I made. Yeah. We'll just, I'm very tired. I don't know why all of a sudden. They gave Dominic quite a lot here. Like he showed way some guts, much. which was weird. Way too much. I used to, like, had some fire, yeah. like some resolve, some uh, intestinal fortitude, as Mick Foley used to say. This face buster, this uh, X Factor, yeah. absolutely terrible. This 619, like you'll half jog. It's like he's so worried mm -hmm. about getting his hands on the rope to do the swing. Yeah. Like that's his main, yeah. that's his, that's like f paramount in his mind is, can I get my hands on this thing? And once he gets his hands on, it's like you can see the relief. He's like, oh, <laughs> but that's like, that's what he puts behind the kick. I'm reminded, of, there was a Pro Evo color analyst that used to like, if you had a really like sort of, lazy or lethargic or old defender. For some reason, they built into the game. And said, huh, he has a turning circle of a traction engine. It was like, well, that's a bit cruel. But that's Dominic trying to get round for that. It's like his legs take ages like, to it's swing it's around. It's like a they? frigate. <laughs> it's like a frigate. It's a... Uh, frigate, I'm going for it. Dom. Where, at some point, we're all going to look back, maybe in about five, ten years, and think, what was that about? <laughs> <laughs> about, Dom, uh, about Dominic Mysterio. Like... He's, we've discussed at length the relative merits of Dominic Mysterio and look like there's professional wrestlers out there who would kill for what he did at WrestleMania last year. Mm -hmm. What an absolute end-to-end -end triumph that entire deal was with his dad. Yeah. Like, just totally wonderful pro wrestling promotion, character building, self-aware soap opera. Did kill for that match that entrance, the character, the whole bit. It's got such a limited shelf life. Mm. I think it's already on the wane. He kind of did. Like, at some point, it's an extremely effective one-dimensional character. Yeah. And it's so odd that Dominic Mysterio, of the character of heel Dominic Mysterio, will have been, when all's said and done, and booms bust and cycles begin anew, that the boom period for WWE post 2002, he will have been one of the main characters. Yeah. Definitely. One of the, honestly, looking at those NXT ratings and the whole deal with uh, Ray, like one of the best things, one of the most effective things. I just don't think he's going to get it. He has been wrestling full time for four years, there are thereabouts. Yeah. And he's been wrestling a lot. They returned to touring in 2021. Mm hmm. At one point, at what point, rather, does it become, oh, he's just never going to get this. There's going to be some kind of flimsy 
like pace week thing in every match. Like he just is so poor. It's so much, and I know there's so much he's poor at. Pales in comparison to the important stuff that he's nailed. But mm. like the thing is, it comes back to that philosophical thing we talk about at length with WWE. At some point on the wrestling show, you can call it whatever you want. It's wrestling. Mm. They have to wrestle, and sometimes for God's God forsaken reasons, they have to wrestle for 14 minutes on television. A lot of, once upon a time, probably not in this era, a lot of times uh, managers, people that would feature prominently in wrestling, would they've have... Got them, they've got them licked on work rate. Would have gone through training school, become better wrestlers than Dominic, like, has ultimately become. Maybe not have his connection with the crowd, but even then... His connection would, with the button. It would be acknowledged that, uh, you know what, they're going to they're gonna serve this purpose. I'm not thinking of a Bobby Heenan level can do it all. Just everybody has some basic level of how to bump and train and whatever, but they're just found to not be that great in the ring, but they've got this charisma and whatever, and you can parlay that into a, a job as a manager. Some people would work as referees, commentators even. Maybe he's a manager in a post-manager world. That's it. I think there is... Dominic can do stuff, and he fits more than just being... Like a Nepo baby, there is clearly, a, like I say, a connection that he's forged, button or not, with like the audience. He fits as this mascot of the. He's always fit as a mascot of the yeah. Judgment Day, big talking, but can't really back it up. And yet, there's like fewer spots than ever for someone with his skill set. Uh, so he wrestles. I was just, I was just removed from it, just absolutely removed. If you're not into the character, which I'm not, I, I, I was never a big Judgment Day guy, and I think that they've they've had their day. Yeah. Right, we're, we've we hit a great glorious peak, and now we're on their decline. And you have the chance to break them up before they just feel dead. Yeah, I, I just I can't watch this for fourteen minutes. Uh, uh, feel sorry for those who. Do. You know what? It's me. I feel sorry for because you had to watch it for this review. Well, because like I, I I hate know it all, dickheads. I try not to be, even though I can fall into that trap. I, I do try not to be that person. I don't know at all. I don't know much. I know don't know decent, much. I, I know a decent amount actually. <laughs> I uh, just like if you're vaguely discerning mm -hmm. about what passes the mustard, you, I cannot watch them. It's just not good. I know you will like. That's Drew McIntyre. Not even the worst thing on the show. Actually, the worst thing on the show, which we'll get to, and I love to bury it, <laughs> was not contained within the ring. Ah. I thought you were going to say it was, so I'm interested in where that is. Yeah. Uh, a little right. twist for later. Uh, we got Drew McIntyre backstage. He says he's going to go and win the Elimination Chamber and then win the World Heavyweight title. Uh, he says he wants to be the saviour of WrestleMania with all these people trying to ruin it. Gets interrupted by LA Knight. Yeah. Uh, Drew McIntyre immediately tries to pie him off and say, uh, you're nothing but a catchphrase. You've got this, this, and this, but I'm going to I'm gonna win a title at WrestleMania. Elliot Knight says, thanks for the old vice, old timer, which is a pretty cool line. Like, Drew tries to get it's a word. four years older than Yeah, he is, yeah. Tries to get a word in, but he can't with him. Uh, Elliot Knight um, says he's uh, got this CM Punk shirt here. He'll, uh, he'll make a space on the name next to Punk's on the grave for you uh, if you think you've got a chance at Elimination Chamber. They get, like, separated, and later on it's announced that there's going to be a match on next week's SmackDown between the two, which will be the... Go home for, and I guess taped as well, which I hadn't thought about until just right now. Yeah, it's, it's going to be taped. in the cane for next Saturday's show. Drew's on Raw. Yes, but it's uh, chamber season, you see, Sitch. So they're uh, flouting the rules. Um, because so it's, it's very, uh, so it's WWE season. It's very important that the uh, sort of the prestige and the um, importance of the, and the gravitas of the brand split is upheld for segments that we've got later on the show. Otherwise, those segments would simply not make sense. And I can't see that happening on a Triple H show. Yeah. So it must make sense. Uh, the Bloodline uh, scene arriving. Oh no, we changed the button. But pretty much that, yeah. It's uh, Jimmy Uso waiting to greet them. And Roman is full of beans to see him, calls him Big Jim, gives him a hug, says, let's clean up another one of the messages that Jay made, blaming Jay Uso for everything that's happened with WrestleMania. I don't know what that's about. No. Uh, they're all excited, all smiles, all is well. Um, we've Jay's got been, part, well, just doing stuff with Bronson Reed and Gunther. Indeed. So I guess Roman's just keeping Jimmy's head on his brother. On a swivel. Them, even on a swivel. Yeah. Everybody's head in WWE's on a swivel. You've got to be to uh, make it in that great fed. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you that for true. It's Usos. Tyler Bate and Pete Dunn. I've got the name written down now. We discussed this on the Raw preview, which you can get wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, are ready to win the tag team titles. Tyler Bate thinks they need a team name. He says... Uh, Mustache Mountain. He says, Peter, my chum, we are the new catch republic. Catch is in. We've got the No Quarter Catch crew, New Catch Republic. It's a uh, shorthand for but it's, pretty it's, boring rest. It's, it's, uh, catch is 
obviously we know the etymology of catch in wrestling. Yeah. Catch is catch. Catch is can. catch can. But it's uh yeah, it's now a synonym for <laughs> the boring guys who are good at wrestling. They can be catching. The last people that managed to stick around after the catch UK. <laughs> Da catchers. You can, you've got da catchers across multiple New brands. Catch Republic. New Catch Republic. NCR. 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 Right, when they do UK shows. Oh, God. Yep. New Catch Republic. Yeah, the Miz should join them. Agree. Oh! You uh, know, get it because he kind of catch. Dominic Mysterio. Jericho <laughs> could, Chris Jericho could do with joining the New Catch Republic. What, just for nothing else, at least, then he's out of AEW. Well, that and <laughs> he's not very good at catching these days. No, he's he? not, is he? Not very good at much. Uh, Dominic Mysterio <laughs> comes in to <laughs> a challenge uh, for them, says, oh, you're going to lose at Elimination Chamber, and says, oh, if you think so, we'll beat you and our truth in a match next week. Dominic's like, our truth's not in the bloody judgment day. But that match, or a version of it, possibly, with JD McDonough is set for SmackDown as well. Um, next up, we've got a... Sorry, anything on that? Anything more on just, that? Just... I come back Willborn. I don't want to review this next week. <laughs> We've got, oh God, yeah, I've just thought about it. We won't need to. The go home Smackdowns, we never need to cover because it's all about the chamber. So I will never need to review New Catch Republic versus Dominic uh, Mysterio and JD McDonald. Yes. Whew. Uh, Zelina Vega, Tiffany Stratton. This was the thing I thought you were going to pick up on because there's something in this. Oh boy. Um, it's the Elimination Chamber qualifier. So they. Bring up at the start here the WWE 2K24 ratings of both Stratton and Zelina Vega as a way to promote the game. And Stratton's got 79 to Zelina Vega's 74, which feels weird considering that in kayfabe this is uh, Tiffany Stratton's second main roster match ever. Um, but aye, right, so the game has rated her more than Zelina Vega. Commentators sort of make note of that as Zelina Vega tries to start quickly. As, well, as you know, Tiffany Stratton is a former NXT women's champion. That's true. And Zelina Vega has not held that belt. And she's so. experienced more success in her time as a WWE superstar than Zelina Vega. I want to take this opportunity, this platform. How do you, like, not get these things when it's total Wikipedia city in WWE? It's all stats and history and... I'd like have you drilled into your head yet? I'd like to apologise for anybody watching or listening to this for not picking up the continuity of the Fed. And I'm grateful, as always, for Michael Sidgwick, my esteemed colleague, making sure that we don't miss any of that company's greatness. Uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, you're, worse, right. you're worse than him. They brought out to the floor, uh, at which point we see uh, Legado del Fantasma there. They've got ringside seats. They're kind of like there. To Will Bourne will be back soon. I know people earnestly like SmackDown. Yeah, he's back tomorrow. Uh, and earnestly just like him in this seat rather than me or you. The Zelina Vega, Legado Fantasma feud continues. So after the break, the LWO come out to even the sides a little bit. Um, we've got Zelina Vega, <laughs> this sounds familiar from an advert, fighting out of a chin lock. Um, they trade a bunch of two counts, uh, Stratton hits an Alabama slam, um, but Zelina Vega manages to, go on. Oh, did you see, they went viral on X mm -hmm. the other day, like Spike Dudley's best bumps. I didn't see that one. Oh my God. I've seen them, but I hadn't seen them in a while. The Hardcore Holly Alabama Slam <laughs> on Spike Dudley, it's like, it's a crime. Yeah, proper. It, it's a crime, and I know Spike Dudley would have taken it. That was his bit, but come on, Bob. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's just vile. I finish it, I kick your ass, you little puke. Yep. Yeah. You puke. That stuff. Um... Oh, so anyway, uh, sorry, Alabama, that's all right. Alabama slam, uh, but Vega counters back. She manages to stop the uh, first attempt at the prettiest moonsault ever. They go back to the floor. Um, Vega's rammed into the barricade, which is where the Legados were sitting. Uh, that briefly triggers a brawl with Electra Lopez. Uh, she manages to deal with that, but walks straight back in, gets hit with the Tiffany Stratton spine buster. Stratton goes up and hits the uh, prettiest moonsault ever for the pin and the win, uh, which I assume was a shoot, because if you get hit with a moonsault that hard, you're certainly not kicking out. Jesus Christ. Uh, we love Tiffany Stratton, but this was all knees to uh, Vega's upper body, a sternum, a chest. Uh, she looks in quite some pain, and Stratton gets the win, advances to Elimination Chamber. Yeah, before we get to that PME, um, there's a sequence when they're trying to get out of the ring. Um, and it feels like an arm drag off the apron. Yes. Uh, Terrible. Not great, yeah. Not great. It just looks like, who's meant to be doing a move here? Mm -hmm. Or are you just kind of falling out of the ring at the same time in this cooperative dance? It's supposed dance? to be Vega's, like, Lucha-inspired. It looks crap. Like, like, doesn't look good. Hit and move and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, it doesn't look great, does it? Doesn't look good. And there's a... Right. I watch this show generally bleary-eyed on a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. So... Like, I'm just tired. Maybe I've not slept enough. Maybe I've been woken up too early. 
Sometimes I feel like I'm saying things in a mirage. <laughs> Tiffany Stratton does this kind of like cartwheel. Mm -hmm. It's Lady Frost does it as well, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's like a cartwheel, and then at the same time as I'm cartwheeling, I'm grabbing the opponent, lifting them up. Yeah. Was it Zelina Vega who did it? Like, so Tiffany Stratton does a cartwheel, and then Zelina Vega just ends up stuck to her. Yes. That's kind of how it played out. It's, it, what was this? It was both cooperative and looked like they were on totally different pages. It was the worst of both worlds, effectively. But like, how could that... Po how, if someone cartwheels in front of me... Yeah, it was to set up a bunch of, um, like, sunset flip type... Near yeah, forms, but just like, yeah. if someone cartwheels in front of us, I'm not going to go, oh, well, time to go for a ride. And hold on, I'm just going to get out of their we way. dazed in the moment by the athleticism. Yeah. Yeah. That's not right. good. Not That's good. Not, not great. Not great no. match. Not a great match. And then, yeah... On this prettiest moonsault ever. Good God. Oof. This is not the first time that Tiffany Stratton's whiffed the timing and really collided with the person who's meant yeah. to be taking it. And this uh, this is the opposite ends of the extreme I was talking about. It can ever just be like great work down the middle. <laughs> really, like really perfectly executed. You either get the weakest looking thing you'll ever see in your life, other than me, and that is Dominic <laughs> Mysterio's... <laughs> Dominic Mysterio's, I'm just anticipating the, the comments, that is either Dominic Mysterio's Piss Week 619, yeah. or I would rather take Vader's Moonsault than Tiffany Stratton's at this point. Because it's going to hurt, but you at least brace for it. Well, I need to probably land right. Yeah. I like, so we've seen Stratton hit 100 of these on NXT, and they go right substantially more than they go wrong, but it's been two on the main roster and... So far, I so maybe you put it down to nerves. Yeah. But then isn't the whole point? And again, we are fans of Tiffany Stratton. Character works down pat. She showed that she can literally excel in an in-ring environment. Yeah. But if the whole point is, oh, you know, maybe she's still a bit green or jitters on the main stage on TV. What's the what's NXT for? And as we were saying, they're lining up a moonsault off one of the pods in the chamber. That's definitely happening. So that can't be like. Can't feel great, kind of, if they're saying, oh, we're thinking you might do a moonsault off the pod, and then they watch that spot play yeah, out. Yeah, I, and another thing as well, just generally and broadly, like, it was, the NXT to main roster thing was always a problem under Vince, because as you perfectly articulated once upon a time, you would look at the names, you've never watched the show, yeah. <laughs> on an 8 by 10 and go, all right, um, I'll go with the blonde Lacey Evans, the muscly guy EC3. Oh, that, uh, those heavy machinery guys, one of them looks wacky. <laughs> and Lars Sullivan, he's he's a freak. I can, he's a monster. I can make some money with him. That's when he did the six, I think it mm -hmm. was. And prior to then, it was like, right, it's time. He was hot on your NXT show. We'll debut him. On your stupid little brand. On your stupid little brand. Yeah. Who can we debut the night after WrestleMania? Right, it's sort of like just, he's just dropped the title and it's time for them to come up or whatever, and there's no fixed plan. It would almost invariably end in total disaster. So it was always bad. Now it's better because you do get a plan. Like something like, I think the best example to use is Solo Sikoa. Solo Sikoa. <laughs> um, clearly promoted as part of a storyline, as part of a twist, becomes a featured player. Yeah. That was how it was meant to go all along. It's still, in my opinion, a fundamentally flawed model if you watch NXT. It's not like this fresh new signing is a Tiffany Stratton. No. Because I've seen her wrestle loads. Yeah. And I'm getting less of a character now. Well, I'll tell you, let's jump ahead a little bit then on that because it seems like most relevant to this discussion and there's nothing else really to say about the segment. Um, we had uh, in in this match and then in a couple of other ones, there was cuts to um, Nick Aldis, like showing Jade Cargill and Brombreaker a good time. They were in like the nicest seats. They were in the box. They were having food, all that sort of thing. The idea was to get them both signed to SmackDown. And ultimately, there's an uh, issue where Jade Cargill is about seemingly about to sign. And then Tiffany Stratton walks in, boots off with uh, Liv Morgan and Bianca Belair, head of Elimination Chamber. And Jade's like, what are you doing getting in the way of my big night sort of thing? So she refuses to sign. Conversely, Bron Breaker uh, looks happy with his contract, gives it back to Aldis, and Aldis brings him out on the stage in front of everybody. There's some like gimmick photographers there. They make it's a sporting announcement type deal where he signed the SmackDown contract. So they're trying, at least there, to suggest that it, like almost the Aldis or Pierce, whoever got him, can't believe the look. Like they've, you know, the guy that's in our developmental system who exists to basically ultimately wrestle on one of our shows. Guys, he's wrestling on one of our shows. Like they were acting as if they were working for AEW and they had signed him. Yeah, this is. Another attempt, I guess, to try and... It's so phony. 
Yeah, it is. I mean, fun. I, I, I it hate. Is funny, but it, like, I don't like being this guy, you know. But people think I actively enjoy. I don't like being this guy. But is this not them attempting to address your exact criticism there of bringing somebody up as a a big deal? Like, yes, you might be familiar with them, but here they are, I'm like not familiar. Packaged, but I'm you know, familiar. Yeah, more familiar. Can we talk about this segment where well, we're doing it? Yeah. So Jade Cargill. <laughs> And Bron Breaker are getting uh, the schmooze. Yeah. Is that what we call it? Getting yeah. schmoozed. The schmooze treatment. <laughs> getting the schmooze. Getting <laughs> the schmooze. In the same place as just, you know, uh, Bianca Belair and Liv Morgan are yeah. hanging out. Mm-hmm. So Tiffany Stratton can walk in, which sets up interactions in the chamber, mm-hmm. maybe a TV match. And it allows Jade Cargill to go, whoa, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. I'm not getting this fancy schmooze treatment, so I'm out of here. Yeah. First of all, I hate to break it to Jade Cargill, who I've got loads of respect for, genuinely. If you don't like getting interrupted, <laughs> bad news. Uh, you're a wrestler, and it ain't going to get better for you on Raw. And, and... It wasn't very good for you on Dynamite in this regard. Do you know either. what that feels like? That's her performance center, isn't it? Getting interrupted in interviews. Pretty much. Like, <laughs> Maybe she got the hell away from AEW because she was sick of being interrupted all the time. She had like PTSD. Oh, not this again. Not this again. Maybe it's L- maybe it's long term storytelling. Good catch, Sitch. Another another great catch of the storytelling that goes on here on Friday Night SmackDown. Right. Another point I want to make. Right is that even if, okay, even if, right, <laughs> you're telling me that yeah yeah, yeah you spent. Th- three years with the Tiffany Stratton character or there or thereabouts. And yes, you've seen her. So it's not like this hot new signing that you must pay attention to because you've seen her. But let's just say, right, okay, they are making a big deal and giving them the schmooze treatment and yeah. treating them as big deals, which allows the uh, the WWE fans in turn to go, oh Christ, the general managers really want them on the show as talents. Mm-hmm. Let's pay attention to them because I'm being told they're a big deal, right? Even on those terms, this was a disaster. Not a disaster. That's a um, total YouTube hyperbole. I apologize for that. <laughs> but my God, right? If you're trying to, like, get this superstar on your hands to the point where you're whining and dining them and they're getting the schmooze treatment and all the rest of it, the fact that all of this scene unfolds at the same time as just there's just roster members just talking it's not like you're getting the special treatment. Not really. It's like no. you've just been put in a glorified locker room. Yeah. At the same time as, uh, all right, okay, yeah, yeah, both of you in. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Your names don't matter. Just like you sign these contracts. Yeah, yeah, don't. It's not. Why are they all in the same room together? It's, it's quite it's quite WWE to think, uh, what's the one thing better than being a WWE fan and watching a WWE event live in person? It's that with some free food. Like in their mind, there is nothing uh, better no, yeah. than watching SmackDown, but also with a free dinner. And why? What, what could we possibly offer these people? Why are they like, surely, if you don't want to put it in the in, in the heads of these elite athlete yeah. TV stars, aspiring proper athlete TV stars, you do it separately. Mm-hmm. You do this process separately. Make them, you make yeah. them feel. Mm-hmm. I know I'm overthinking this more than literally anybody else in the wrestling fandom. I don't care. I'm going to do it. The idea of like, uh, which two from the factory are next? Them two sign your contracts at the same time. You're not feeling singled out like no. special treatment. And to something we discussed on Friday on the news, which you can still catch on What Culture's YouTube channel, Jennifer Pepperman has left WWE, a female voice in the writer's room, of which there are not many. And I kind of flagged up a couple of weeks ago, Naomi's return was just, she walks out of a locker room, contract signed, immediately gets into an argument, and you have general managers going, bloody shut up, GBH to the ear. And they've cast Bron Breaker. I mean, thank you, we've done some excellent business here. Great gentleman doing business. And Jade Cargill is like, will you bloody shut up so I can get my attention, please? It's not great. No, like it's the not optics great. again are not great. The two returns that you had at the Rumble in Naomi and Jade, two of the bigger moments of yeah. the whole show, have kind of been reduced to rank and file because the bloody women's division needs some attention. Ooh. Yeah. This reminds me of a story. It's kind of the opposite, but the same. Bear with me on this one, okay. right? So the idea is like, which two are next from the factory? Yeah, yeah, here's your contracts, blah, blah, blah. Not like saying, oh, you are the one we want. Obviously, like in a football negotiation, 
they're going to be trying to sign six different players. Yeah. But they're savvy enough to say, oh, you're the one we want. We'll take you and you alone out mm-hmm. dinner, maybe with your family. Not go, all right, the two that we want, put them together. It's just not done. You're meant to make your prospective client feel like they are the most important thing in the world, mm. even if in reality you've got about three, four, or five most important things in the world. Like if you wanted someone's business, right, and you were like, uh, wanted to take care of their investments, you wouldn't say, Gary, I just go with him. Yeah, yeah, go with them. You know what I mean? The whole point is you alone are what we need, mm-hmm. right? Obviously, I'm man of my business, apparently. <laughs> this reminds me of a story, and it's horrendous, genuinely horrendous, but also you can kind of see the funny side. I will probably need the names from fellow long-suffering Newcastle United fan, Adam Nicholas, our producer, mm-hmm. right? But there was, this reminds me of like, I, I cannot believe this is a story, but because it's Newcastle and we're a clown show, yes, I can. <laughs> it's at the end of the season and there's two players and their contracts are running down. And I think they expire at the end of the season. Nicholas, correct me if I'm wrong. And if, I'm, and if you can't remember either, just say that the names might be wrong, but the story's the same. So they get the call, and I think is it John Carver rings them up? Great guy. My, if it's not John Carver, I apologize. It's someone high up in management in Newcastle United Football Club. And they say to Jonas Gutierrez, one of our players from way oh, back in the story. day. I know this story. Way back in the day, they ring up his mobile, knowing that, right, <laughs> we're basically ringing this footballer up to say, you're out of contract, we're not renewing you, You'll be a free agent. Basically, you've lost your job. Yep. Thanks for the memory. See you later. So whoever, it might be Carver, it might be somebody else, rings up Honas, one of the players, and says, um, right, just to let you know, probably would be nice to do this over dinner mm. or in a formal meeting, but just on your mobile. Uh, yeah, we're not picking up your contract. Um, I cheers. Thanks for everything, but you're out of a job. Uh, see you later. So Honas is on the phone, and they say, hang on. Save some time here. Is Ryan <laughs> Taylor there? <laughs> and Hannes is like, yeah, yeah. He passed the phone to him. Yeah. Okay. Passes the phone to the other player they're going to release from their contract and say, aye, uh, aye, thanks for the memories, but we don't need you anymore. See you later. You've lost your job. See you there. This just saves us dialing the phone. There is an identical John Laurinaitis story we talk about incompetent idiots in powerful jobs. And I think... It's uh, Jackie Gator and Charlie Haas, maybe, but it's with a married couple or a couple within wrestling that are, oh, while you're there, you know, like I've just bought 50% of your household out of work. Here comes the other half, <sighs> might be in Maria and Mike Canales. You know, like a wrestling uh, couple, couple have made that exact thing, like that kind of, that, just that like- I was thinking there. Yeah. Right, class, this will save me the courtesy of firing you over the phone. Like- the, an executive move so callous, they don't even know I, how callous it is I, to, to do that. Yeah, Gross people. Um, should we lighten the mood with the other uh, darkness of AJ Styles? Because the, oh, the framing of this shot was fantastic. Emo AJ is sat inside a locker just thinking about how the world can work when it's round. <laughs> like he's looking all conflicted like, hey man, I just heard that new Green Day record and I think I made some great points about the news being a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> he gets interrupted by the OC. Obviously, they've not been seeing eye to eye lately. It's part it's to the sports with... section. They all playing a game. <laughs> it's partly to do with why AJ has gone down this yeah, lonely road of faith. And uh, anyway, he says like uh, like that. They're like, what's up, AJ? And he doesn't say anything in return because he's too busy thinking about stuff. So what's he thinking about? I've been watching this he's... and I just don't really. So he got beaten up to be taken out injured. <laughs> Time to play the game! Time to play the game! What could flat earther, empty headed AJ Styles be thinking about? The Jaguar. The <laughs> Jaguar. I bought the Jaguar. I bet he is. I bet he's thinking about consoles. Yeah. Anyway. He's having a good old think. So he's not answering the OC's questions. And uh, Carl Anderson just gets in his face. Just come back, turned heel. Yeah, sorry, yeah, he came back, turned heel. No, no, I know all this. I'm just trying to unpack how bad it is. Comes back, kind of as a heel. Wants his revenge on the bloodline. Doesn't get it. Roped into a four-way, which he loses. People are like, well, it's better than you when he took water on you. And that was funny. You're nothing to us now. Thanks for the flips. 
get lost. He's like, got a lot on his mind. It's weird. This AJ run, it's been poor for as long as it was ever good in WWE for me. He's got a lot on his uh, plates, plates of meat, and your plates of meat are flat. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing about AJ is like, I don't think is a... We'll talk about this and I'll talk about AJ. Well, yeah, Carl Anderson says, um, I've forgotten where he came from. AJ, like, sparks his life by that level. Push and pull, whatever. Carl Anderson, uh, sorry, Gallo splits them both at Meech and looks really upset about what is clearly the death of the OC and the part where it's probably going to be a match between Anderson and uh, AJ Styles. Oh, Jesus. Who's going to watch that? The thing about AJ is, like, he's, I understand maybe he's happy to just get that bag, as the kids say, yeah. as people way younger than me say. He's absolutely jacked. He's absolutely moment. jacked. Um, I, I do know this. <laughs> I just think he's, uh, his credentials as a modern great are kind of fraying mm. week by week, month by month, year by year. People There's a way of account of how long he's been at this since like 2016 in WWE. And the, yeah. the legacy is like full of bangers. Some, a lot of good matches, but very few great And ones. they're not great storylines or promos yeah. or character developments or anything like that. It's just ordinarily wrestlers in a lot of cases just get, better and better and better and better, the older they get, mm. the more experienced they get, they can do loads with little. Like that isn't the case with AJ at all. Like no. I don't think he's aging gracefully as a professional wrestler. It doesn't feel like he's on the WrestleMania whiteboard at all, does he? No. Nah. Like LA Knight may be at a push if he's not getting moved into something with Logan Paul. Yeah. Like AJ would be the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Well, there's now for you, but we see you as a star. Yeah. So we'll hold your name on that. It's just weird. Like, I've got no interest in this stuff with the OC. Nah, none at all. Nobody does. It was as good as dropped when AJ came back, effectively. I mean, like, it's not as if the OC were doing anything. They exist because AJ exists, yeah. basically. Um, Damage Katara, however, got quite a lot going on. They, um, it's the remaining members of Damage Katara uh, cutting a promo to the camera. It's got subtitles, obviously. They're coming for Bailey at WrestleMania. Uh, EO says, yeah, might have started with your vision, but we've taken it to far greater heights. Um, and then they threaten Dakota Kai with not making a stupid decision to side with Bailey and all of this. And we'll have a little bit more on that later. Um, squash up next. It's a final testament. All coming out together. They've got the bells and whistles now. They've got the brand in the T-shirts, the whole deal. Yeah. Uh, and AOP. Uh, destroy, ah, oh, destroy Big Body Javi. Ah. Oh. Uh, and, and another jobber called Bo Morris. It's a complete squash super collider in the big, like, it's their crap version of Total Elimination, isn't it? The yeah, Running yeah. clothesline SDO slam thing. It's like a minute long. It's just... AOP squash because they're back, etc. But I could see you were just fizzing with excitement to talk final testament in their final form that we got here. When the final testament come out, you can hear a rare piss on can. <laughs> like this is a totally dead non-start of an act. It's yeah. a, t it's like Triple H at his most indulgent. Yes, so much so I'd be shocked if they didn't go for twenty-five minutes in near silence at WrestleMania. That's how Triple H this is. Triple H is indulgent. Is just wanting to get carrying crossover I in general. So the fact like, that it's part of now is like a stable. Derek aesthetic, yeah. metal, hard, ugh, yeah. gruff. It sucks. Uh, it's a total non-starter. Uh, rat piss on cotton stuff. I liked the AOP at their pump in NXT, but like people forget, man, this is like years ago. Mm-hmm. Like the gap between before the new generation and attitude era. That's how old all of this is. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of carry jobs as well. You could see them as soon oh, as they were. High, but carry them on the main roster. Do yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's just not working. It feels a complete non-starter. Tell you what I am a fan of, the grunts. Yeah. And Those kinds of noises when lots of when like a horse monsters are like doing stuff like that. I, now I like, I like a grunt. Do you want to watch? Probably, no. Probably going to get it, whether you want it or not. Do you want to watch this impending Bobby Lashley Street Profits? In person at WrestleMania? Yeah, yeah. Because no, it's don't. feeling like it's happening, isn't it? There can be no other reason why they're delaying this. And then you have the stable get beat, and then what? How do a bunch of these guys as losers know? I, know. I think she should come up with NXT, actually. Wreak havoc in NXT. <sighs> you want you want Karrion Cross in NXT again? No. Think about what you're saying yeah. carefully. We had, we had to endure this. It was quite harrowing. Yeah, good point. You're right. There is no place for any of them. Um... To Logan Paul, who uh, wants to beat The Miz. He says he's going to qualify for the Elimination Chamber, become a double champion at WrestleMania, get revenge on Seth Rollins for the prior year, and there's going to be a thank you, Logan, hashtag, just for getting The Miz out of the way, basically. There's an ad at this point for WWE World, which will presumably be their uh, access. I thought you was dead. 
<laughs> like what? The WWE World? The, um, the New York yeah, yeah. Uh, like food place? No, it's well, it's back. It's back in Philadelphia for four days. I'm going to be there all four days. Uh, it's like an access superstore thing. Um, oh, man. I might, just, I might just grab a usage and we'll head down the queue. Uh, and we'll just walk up and down the queue uh, like we did in Cardiff, Wales. And uh, speak to some really nice people in the queue. Yes. It was great when they took over a shopping center in the middle of Cardiff, wasn't it? Was I? So we'll find a WWE World in, uh, in Philadelphia. You want to come? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's Miz and Logan Paul next yeah. up. Uh, Paul gets right in Miz's face. Um, so Miz immediately takes control, gets him over at the apron. But uh, Logan Paul is back with a crossbody. Uh, <laughs> hits a standing moonsault again, like a bit of a sloppy night for everybody. Because like he hits, kind of hits, ne- Miz sort of counters, but Logan registers that he got him. So he has to go for a cover. But he's clearly winded by it or something. So there's just been a miscommunication. Not great. Um, but they managed to reset. Miz goes into the corner. He's working uh, Logan Paul's leg. Um, that's at the first point at which we see uh, Nick Aldis in the sort of the fancy seats. Um, Who? There's a, the SmackDown general manager. Where are my manners? Uh, Logan, I just thought I was, I was trying to do your bit. I don't like to do the bit with you. I, 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 don't, I, said I, don't, I don't want, I don't want you to feel ousted from the bit, you know. It's okay. like, well, I'm in the bit now. Oh, great. You not doing the bit just further ousts me from the bit. Oh, fantastic. That's a bit exception. Uh, there's a Feynman's carry roll by Logan Paul as we go to the break with <laughs> like him doing a springboard clothesline, which lays Miz flat on the uh, hardest part of the ring and then goes up top and hits a splash onto the Miz. And that's what our SmackDown Rolls On segment is. Logan Paul's really quite good. At it's this. not bad. Like it's it's all moves to move sick. Let's be honest. It's like again, he's a he's a Jack. Not to, not to tell me this. Jack Slippy or Shane McMahon, but so well, got, it, he's, mm, no, he's Shane McMahon does Hangman Page. Yeah, that's what Logan Paul is. I'll take that. Um, we come back from the ads. Uh, Miz has managed to get control again. Um, he hits like a, a downward spiral. They go into the corner. He pulls out. Pulls him out of the corner with a code break. He gets a two count. Miz goes for his uh, figure four. When Paul manages to get to the ropes, he also um, like throws the referee off because he like sort of messes with the uh, the ring skirt. Um, Logan goes for Miz's eyes at that point. Gets a skull crushing finale. That get, gets a pretty hot two count in the building. We get like a sunset flip exchange. Miz goes back for another figure four. Um, this time Logan rolls all the way out. His friend Jeff who's always there in the best seat in the house with the brass knuckles, hands the brass knuckles over to Logan Paul. The Miz manages to intercept that, uh, at which point Logan Paul rolls back into the ring. The Miz goes for his uh, patented springboard. See? <laughs> but he's able, he's such an athlete, you see, that he's able to hold his dive when he sees Logan getting back up to his feet. But when Miz goes again to try and readjust, it's, it's not bad, it feels real-ish. Um, Paul manages to grab his leg and pull him into the rope that... It's a low blow without it being a low blow. He crotches him on the rope. Miz gets back in the ring. Logan's able to hit his metal Lex Luger fist. Miz is just completely knocked out, leaning on uh, Logan Paul's shoulder. He hits him like with a pull down STO slam. Gets the win. It was academic at that point. Logan Paul's off to Elimination Chamber. These finish doesn't look good. No, I don't like overcomplicating it, but I see why they do it because the knockout blows the one. Yeah. And then he's got to make it look as if he's earned it through some sort of. Great, great wrestling, yeah. Move. Like, yeah. Sort of full, like fooling the referee, he could, do, he could do a great wrestling move because Logan Paul can, in fact, do yeah. great wrestling moves on occasion. Yep, um, uh, match was just mostly there. I guess it's impressive that it's what's ninth match or whatever it will be. Yeah, not many. And this is like probably better mm-hmm. or at least comparable to everything else you saw on TV. Yeah, oh, well, this is Logan Paul, isn't it? Like that, he never, yeah, we know he's good, he never feels out of place, even though there's obviously a lot more advantages afforded to him. So, Logan Paul. Is Hangman Page. It's really funny. It's yeah. really funny. He just does Hangman Page's moves. It's yeah, just really likes his offense, doesn't he? And just nicks it. Who doesn't? Yeah. Who doesn't? So he's Shane McMahon in terms of he can kind of do things. Mm-hmm. He shouldn't be able to because he's just he's not a wrestler, but no. he will make make it'll make it make sense. He's yeah. an athlete. He's done some, you know, whatever. Shane McMahon. Not looking like he's in the throes of auto- autoerotic asphyxiation. <laughs> Doing the moves of Hangman Page. Yeah. That's Logan Paul. Every match of his is virtually the same. Yeah. But welcome to the system. I would say they're better, and this is weird, somehow this has worked out, they're better like this against a Miz than when it becomes the Ricochet one we've talked about before at SummerSlam where they're supposed to be competing for who can do the most impressive aerials. Yeah. Like he's actually better within the confines of a normal match. Like the structure yeah. of it suits him, I think, more. Indeed. Because his flashier stuff sticks out a little bit. Yeah. Um he's all everyone looks good next to the Miz. Nope. 
Uh, Paul Heyman speaking to Grayson Waller. We can't hear what he says, and he's not holding up a phone that says the bloodline. bloodline. So we're left only to infer that Grayson Waller, by doing hmm, faces, seems to like what he hears. That's because uh, there's a, a little graphic that flashes up. We're going to get um, Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins on the Grayson Waller effect in Perth. There's not going to be a match, but obviously Grayson Waller's getting his big moment in front of his home crowd. Uh, next to another Elimination Chamber qualifier. Again, it's all like match lengths. Everyone, every single one of them was too long yeah. on the show. Everyone, the Naomi versus Alba Fire, the work wasn't bad here, but the story was, I think, just too basic for the 10, 12 minutes or whatever it got. You've got Isla Dawn on the floor constantly trying to run interference when Naomi has the advantage. She really has the advantage. She's got quite a lot of moves in her arsenal. They're wanting to illustrate that Naomi is not just the flashy entrance or the flashy return. Wade Barrett makes a point of saying on commentary that she did what he did, which was to leave the system entirely because her frustrations were getting the better of her. She's come back. Those frustrations frustrations no longer exist. And she's just able to, <laughs> yeah, she's just able to focus on the in-ring. And that gets stuff here where like um they're counting out of things like um wheelbarrow suplexes and gory bombs and all that sort of stuff. And uh, Naomi has, she manages basically to deal with Isla Dawn's interference eventually and then uses a head scissors. She catches Alba Fire with a head scissors, but just drills her into the floor head first and keeps her body lock to get into like a... Hechicero-esque. Hechicero-esque, yeah. Into a, uh, like a, she's got like um. So basically, regal they're all just copying AW's homework. A regal stretch. Not that I'm air biased or anything like that. Like, is it round the neck? I don't know, rings of satin, maybe something like that. But because of the way she's captured over the head, says she's able to hold on, gets a submission victory, and she qualifies. This was open and shut, really, because you knew Alba Fire was in this as a shotzy replacement. Like, obvious winner, obviously. Yes, yes, stuff. yes. Yeah, yeah uh, this is probably one of the better worked matches on the show. It was broadly good. Yeah. In points, if I'm being pedantic, and we all know I am, Naomi's thing where she kind of ducks and then does the knee slide mm -hmm. at the Joe Willock. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Lewis Hall had a better one, didn't he? The the Premier League football and knee slide celebration. Uh -huh. So Naomi does this to sort of evade. She kind of stays on her knees yeah. with her back to her opponent, mm -hmm. having completed the knee slide for rather a long time. I would simply drop kicker on the back of the head. Yes. It asks for a bit of suspension of disbelief. Yes. Aye. I don't, like, could be faster. I'd, I've already missed Naomi's old entrance theme as well. Oh, like, I, I know they I, have to do this. Why do they have, they don't, they don't have to do shh. They could pay, just to keep the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It was really good. Get some like you've got money People dripping out of your arsehole, WWE. Yeah. Why can't they just license themes? Yeah. Because the new one's not great. Imagine... Naomi's entrance, right, with all of the cool stuff associated, mm -hmm. was something from Discovery by Daft Punk. Oh my god! Well, you obviously <laughs> it's, a, it's timeless. Top five albums of all time, Discovery. Yeah, uh, all of it would work. But yeah, it's not even it's not even the WWE one, which everybody really liked and suited that entrance and all of that. They've changed it to a more generic one. But you know, uh, Dakota Kai. Finds Bailey backstage and uh, tries again to pledge the supports as I was trying to help last week. Bailey's not too sure. She's not prepared. She's not going to be a dumb baby face. Basically, she's not, yeah, I did like this. She's not certain because she's watched the footage back and she could see that you could argue either way with Dakota Kai. Dakota Kai again says, "Look, if you don't believe me, I could be in big trouble with Damage Kataro." But Bailey says she refuses to accept who she should and shouldn't trust and just won't deal with it right now and walks off, leaving Dakota Kai to, to think clearly. I mean, the way to solve this is to just make your actions a bit clearer, isn't it? Like next week on SmackDown now, just attack them. Just yeah, say, yeah, yeah, there you yeah, go, yeah. Look, I'll, I'll attack them for you. We're friends. But it'll be like, like I'm, I'm being facetious here, but I like this. Uh, the, yeah, the yeah, I was going to tell you off for being too facetious <laughs> of anything. This is all right. Yeah. This is all right. It's the, uh, it's the thing to tease out like with this last month of WrestleMania because they've given you the Bailey heel graphic yeah, yeah. straight away. Right. Main event time. Main event time. Main event time. Uh... Bloodline come out. Obviously, you get the typical grandiose bloodline entrance. Paul Heyman gives... Sorry. Wow. <laughs> Standing the L out. Uh, Paul Heyman gives Roman Reigns the microphone. Roman Reigns asks Salt Lake City to acknowledge him. Crowd are banging into him. Um, and it's that Roman thing now where, even though he's a heel, initially he's cheered and people are really excited to see him. And then he says, oh, look, can I uh, just be honest with you? Like Utah. And they're like, yeah, we'd love you to be honest with us, Roman. He says... You're all so dumb. <laughs> and they're like, boo, I didn't see that coming. I thought you were going to be nice to us, top heel in the industry. And then he says, they're not individually. 
just when you all come together, you're such big idiots. And we're kind of worried you're going to ruin what we've got laid out for you tonight. You're going to be in the presence of the biggest stars. Big, big night for the bloodline. Um, and we know that sometimes when big stars come out, you kind of go even dumber. Uh, at this point, there's all the booze. Um, there's a Cody chant that starts. Roman lets that chant breathe through. It says, this is exactly what we're talking about. You can't be ruining history. Not tonight. Um, it's the first night that we can say The Rock is going to join the bloodline. Uh, there's even more booze, at which point The Rock's music hits, and there's a massive thunderous pop in the building. It's what we talk about all the time. The Rock is still The Rock, so there's going to be elements of that. He's the best. I love him. He arrives on the stage. He's wearing a vest, as our American viewers and listeners would say, a waistcoat to us. It's his 1998 Versace shirt with the sleeves cut off. Oh, my God. Straight away. The old shades. Oh, my God. Bit of a scowl. Oh, my God. They're not such an oh, my God, because he does the goosebumps bit, but there's a... Oh, my God. He's foreshadowing by doing the goosebumps bit. We cut to the ad break while he's walking down the aisle. We come in, and Rock's already sent a ring, and the bloodline have taken to a corner to, like, give the Rock the stage, as it were. Uh, Rock says... Uh, He's ready to talk, but before he drops some gospel on Utah, he wants to give him something. He wants to give him a moment. Uh, he's kind of, it's all very baby face rock at this point. Uh, he says, it's going to make everybody happy that tonight here in Utah, you all broke an indoor attendance record. And obviously there's a big reaction again. The rock always loves talking about his stats and that. And he says, they broke the indoor attendance record for the biggest gathering of trailer park trash ever. Oh my God. Huge heat for The Rock. Love him. Like, he's got his glasses on, but you can see the glint in his eye shining through. He's got, you like... You always see the smirk. Yeah, he flashes that little grin. And it's like, oh, The Rock's back. Sorry about this, Nicholas. You must be hating all this gushing, but that was the great one. That great one was in the ring, and he was locked in. And he says, finally, your life has meaning, and you and all your 50 wives with your inbred lives will have stories to tell. Oh, you're going into footy. To your 600 you inbred kids. <laughs> grandkids. <laughs> He says, uh, he's, he does the finally the rock has come back to Salt Lake City. He still gets cheers. It's that old fashioned rock heat at this point where the fans like being insulted. The, I, I put this on X. When he says trailer park trash, I'm transported back to 1999 where I am loving the heel and can't wait for the baby face. To yeah. Him. That's rock in the sweet spot, isn't it? When he's got you there again. Um, like, so the cheers eventually turn to booze. He, uh, he says, like, don't you boo me fatty. Like, calling out somebody at ringside straight away. Stop booing fatty or I'll come over there and smack the herpes off your lips. The Rock is back. Uh, he said, this was great. He said, you dumb idiots. You had it. Me and Roman Reigns. You had the biggest WrestleMania main event ever. And you flushed it all away. So, like, now we're just putting the blame of all of this onto the fans. Oh, that was quite a nice... Yeah. They're, they're not making sense of this story, but they're using some of the changes that have happened to yeah. get this, like, whatever this version of the story that's left is coming across. Um, so says, you had it, and you let it go. You let it slip through your fingers, and another We Want Cody chant picks up. Uh, the Rock starts asking the fans, he says, uh, what even is Cody's story? You want to finish the story, watch the story. Uh, Roman beat... Cody at WrestleMania last year. Like, Cody wants a rematch, but that's just not how it works. It's not how it works, it works in sport. The logic is stupid. You people are stupid. Cody is stupid. Um, he's saying everybody can shut their mouths because they're chanting what him at this point. Uh, he says, look, uh, if, you know, you lose the Super Bowl like last weekend and you pick yourself back up and you get on with it, uh, the 49ers don't whine about their story. Uh, the 49ers move on like men in sport. It's just like how when Michael Jordan came to your town and crushed the Utah Jazz, Utah, like your precious Utah Jazz, picked themselves up and got back on with it. That gets him obviously more. You ever see the first dance? Yeah. They show are like, great. It's incredible. And like obviously the fans are immediately back into that. It's still, still raw. He knows exactly what to go for. He calls them. Spoiled, entitled, little cry baby bitches, bitches, that word in wrestling that just gets that reaction every time. So people are really angry with that. And then he says, and I'm going to use, if, if I may, I'll be the Rocky Bloodline. He's talking down the lens and he says, uh, the Rock is going to do everything in his power to make sure you lose at WrestleMania. Roman is currently looking out into the crowd. And uh, this is one for the ex-detectives because I think you'll find it was pretty subtle when he was sticking his arm fully out yeah. and pointing. A couple of people... Mike's picked up on the old World Wide Web down in the mom's basement. The Rock uttered those words while pointing at Roman Reigns. It's all like Triple H's background stuff. Oh my God, did he see that? I saw it on television. There was a storyline happening in the background of a scene. What? That's uh, it's Oscar stuff. What could, the, uh, what could the clues mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, so he'll do everything in his power to make you a loser at WrestleMania. Could be either way. Uh, but Rock said, and this was the other one, Rock said... 
Cody's story is ending and the bloodlines is just beginning. Eh? Eh? Eh. Uh, and then he says, if you smell, and everybody's getting really excited, hang on with every word, what the bloodline is cooking. Ah, because he uttered your favorite word, uh, is your favorite rock phrase from the Attitude Era. Uh, uh, uh. This is not sing along, along with, with the a champ. champ. What the bloodline is cooking, and uh, as we did from before, puts our salute in the air, if not the exact bloodline one, as the show goes off the air. Well, he hasn't watched a single second. <laughs> is he has not watched a single second yeah. of this apparent. It's funny because he's in Hollywood. <laughs> right. And surely you'd watch the other pictures that are getting produced so you know what your competition is. And I've been told that the bloodline of cinema, the rock hell holding up an L. It's, oh, he got him. I guess. I guess. Either way, he's not watched a second of this. He has not watched a single second. I, I could, I'll do the Iggy. <laughs> I did the Iggy. I acknowledge us. Uh, yeah. yeah, so there's some kayfabe here, there's a couple of like work shoot remarks, there's a couple of potential pivots to clues. We joke, but they're all there potentially to pick up if you want to. Um, let's work those algorithms, brother. Rock, back on SmackDown. Good or bad? Both. All right. Um, well, that's us. See you later. No, no, no. Um, so the thing, right, is that the there was a clear pivot between The Rock coming back WWE generating all of that fan resentment. Yeah. And then the WrestleMania press conference. Mm -hmm. Pivots were made during that time, clearly. Um, because we said all along, if The Rock comes back, is this monumentally, universally over babyface, and everyone's like, oh, it's weird that Cody relinquished the shot, but there's always next year for Cody. This would not be happening. It would be The Rock versus Roman Reigns. Yep. I'm 100% sure of it, right? Okay. Now, the problem is that to get it back on track, you there is no possible way. There is, and I will explain why. There is no possible way of sort of retroactively making Cody's decision slash actions make even an iota of sense. No. He basically said, I want to take everything from you, Roman and I'm coming for your title, just not at WrestleMania. And I've taken some counsel. Like, I need to see the messages here. Yeah. Where's the book, Cody? Yeah. Like, I need to see what counsel The Rock gave him. Where's the book, Pete? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, because that plot hole is just there, it cannot be filled. Mm. It's like one of those bottomless hole deals. Every explanation to even talk around it or try and make sense of it just makes people collectively go, huh? <laughs> So The Rock was trying to talk about sporting logic and what happens in sports and all the rest of it. And he said, when the Utah Jazz came so close, yet so far mm -hmm. from stopping the great Michael Jordan, they didn't just complain. They just got straight back up. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, Cody won the Royal Rumble. Yeah. Cody won the Royal Rumble and willingly relinquished the shot. You will have a job on your hands to make that make sense because the point I'm going to make about this is that The Rock is so great. What a great insight that is. <laughs> the Rock is so good, especially as a heel, at cutting promos, being this untouchable demigod, and driving fans insane. one of his films. Manipulating the audience to do whatever he wants, when he wants them to do it. If heel rock, possibly the best performer on the microphone of all time, mm -hmm. heel rock, can it make sense of the story or sell it or keep you under the spell? If heel rock still makes you go, oh, you're talking rubbish, and you're distracting, it cannot possibly be good. I want, uh, can I, Fold this into a, a question we've had. We were going to do this live on YouTube today. I want to talk more about The Rock. Well, but this is folded in at that okay, exact point okay, you're okay. making. So it feels relevant to bring this question in now. Thank you if you left comments before. We were going to go on YouTube and we couldn't. We had some technical issues, but we're going to Sorry get, about that again. We're going to get to those on this so your money isn't wasted. Thank you very much for your donations. This one comes in from Andy. Referencing that specifically, Andy says, Thoughts on The Rock glossing over Cody's Rumble win. As a delusional character refusing to acknowledge it and being entitled, worked, IMO. A glib villain isn't meant to be a reliable narrator of events. 
like I know sometimes we have like reaching bro takes and it's like you're trying to make up for where they've let the logic down. There's something to that, isn't there? The Rock is so on his own planet in every respect. Yeah, so he hasn't even watched the Bloodline saga, apparently that he wants <laughs> to that he wants to be, you know, at the epicenter of yes. now. It's not so much the Rock's interpretation of events. I like to remember things the way they happened, not necessarily how they actually happened. Yeah. Right. Lost Highway. It's Cody. The, the, you'll ne no one cares because Cody's still really over. Look at those raw quarter hours. Yeah. They're ridiculous. No one really cares. It hasn't completely impacted or hasn't even remotely impacted Cody's popularity. If anything, yes, it has elevated Cody's popularity. It's hard to talk about this one. It doesn't really matter. But you still have to tell the story on the back of it. And totally, yeah. that decision has to inform the rest of the story. That visual is lost where he pointed at Roman. Incredible yeah. Incredible visual of Roman in the skybox. Is dead. None of this makes... None of this matters, but nor does it make any sense. So you're left with this bittersweet, oh, it'd be a shame. I mean, it'd be nice if this made sense, but it doesn't. So I understand that point. From The Rock's point of view, yep, yeah, he's completely aloof. Doesn't really know what's going on. He mm -hmm. just wants to be part of it. That's The Rock. Very superficial character and all yeah. the rest of it. It's Cody who it reflects poorly on, his decision-making. But again, how much does that matter? But we are back at a time when it's not this perfectly whole, complete, good story. It's... Characters that the fans are into in spite of the storytelling. Yeah. And we've had that for years in WWE. So if Heel Rock can't square the circle and make it make sense with his impeccable delivery, you're just going to have to accept this as a flaw in the story going yeah. forward. And just at some point, accept Cody and Rock hate each other for reasons. They're having this, the storyline's changed for reasons. Just get on board with it from this point forward. Mm -hmm. I, right, first of all, The Rock calling people fatties. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's like morphine to me. I, I just find it so funny. Yeah. It's, I just, I, I'm a very, very simple man at trailer times. Park trash just trailer Park me. Trash and Fatties. Yeah, Trailer Park Trash and Fatties, right? right you've, right, that's it, you've won. <laughs> you've charmed me. That's enough for me. Um, the, the fit just looks fantastic. Yeah. But the real, like, he could, People have hated The Rock. Not hated The Rock, but people have come around oh, The Rock. Just, like, detached from The Rock for years because of, like, the STD stuff with Baron Corbin. It felt both ways. He kind of came in detached, didn't he? He was yeah, really yeah. in all of this, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. But, like, babyface return rock era, mm. like, 2016 onwards. Yeah. Hey, 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 hey. You are right. STD, Corbin, all of that rubbish. Like, not good, not good, not good. Like, he could still be accused of fatty, trailer park trash. He's still playing the hits. Mm -hmm. Nothing really new. It's just better material. Yeah. What really impressed me about this was that bait and switch that proved to me it's not necessarily the lines or the catchphrases. It's the way to manipulate that he's got them. The goosebumps thing that he comes out and does was, you know, inspired because you're still not, you're looking at the outfit, you sense something's amiss, he's going to be heel rock. But he is, was it WrestleMania 32 when he came back, lit his name on fire? Adam and he was there. like, yeah, yeah, and he's done, he's attendance record rock. Yeah. And he's all about box office history, the most he's biggest numbers. trending, didn't it? Trending, yeah, trending. So he's thing. always got this thing about numbers and putting over the popularity. For him to subvert that and do the bait and switch of setting of the record, guys, mm. It's the largest gathering of inbred. I, I just thought that was him having fun, dialed in, yeah. really knowing how to get the heat from the audience. A bit of Toronto what, about that, wasn't it? A oh, bit of Toronto. Not but, that. That's, yeah, I mean, he'll it, never but, yeah. beat that. So basically at this point, heel rock, not bad, not good, great. Mm -hmm. Really, really funny as well. The other things that people want to talk about, I will... Do very quickly twice before we get a couple more questions yeah. before we uh, depart. People talk about The Rock, and it's not personal with Roman, but the idea that Rock just dwarfs him as a star, just dwarfs him as a star. That is kind of true. It's unavoidable. It is what it is. It's The Rock. He's, he outgrew WWE 24 years ago. Yeah. 23 years ago. Right, well over two decades ago, it's just a byproduct. The problem for me 
is not just Roman in the fact that he's a bigger star than the guy you've been building is the biggest star since Hogan slash San Martino in the fiction of it all. That's a bit of an issue, but I can't see it being that much of an issue, particularly when Roman is at the end of his run and this WrestleMania is going to do absolute massive business. And you'd be lying to yourself if when Roman and Cody do the stare down, that doesn't feel like the biggest match of the year. Fox's not walking out with him for that singles, is he? You've got no fear of it. Like on the night, it's going to be so hot. WWE so big. Personified I've got no yeah. problems with it whatsoever. I'll tell you one thing though. If I'm, it's so weird. Like critiquing a rock promo. Yeah. It's like it's the rock <laughs> as a heel. It feels weird to do this. I really think, and there's still time to do this, and he still might. He really could have done with just pumping up Solo and Jimmy a little bit, mm. saying how good they've done or all the rest of it, because Jesus Christ. You know those, um, I can't remember a specific example off the top of my head, right? But you know when there's like a, someone who's just turned heel sometimes comes out with a security detail yeah. to keep the bad, uh, the goody who they've wronged away from them. So there's a security detail. And you just see these random wrestling trainees yeah. or locals or who you got in your school or we saw it with like Breaker mm -hmm. before he was on NXT TV where you just play the security guards. Like there's a tier below them and on Friday it was Solo and Jimmy. <laughs> the Rock, they might as well have not existed. Yes, he said the bloodline. Yeah. But he only, he didn't even acknowledge Heyman. It was just me and Roman. So I don't they think... They have to do something. Well, so I don't think... Solo's been... I don't personally think he had it in him to be a proper main event star yeah. solo ever. I thought he did really well as the silent enforcer role. But ever since he beat John Cena, mm. he's done out and he's he's in danger of looking like not a star at all. Well, they've not even dined out on it, really. You've not moved him in. I think he might sort of say, for example, have a Randy Orton at WrestleMania and that'll be... Oh, exactly. I'm going. I don't want to watch it. But well, that'll be presented as this big thing. Maybe like Randy will be there to sort of protect Cody's interest by beating him, but so we'll get the win, whatever. Um, on the Rock's failure to acknowledge Jimmy and Solo, maybe that's the third of th three clues. Let's talk about that clues. What do we think of the point? What do we think about the, I'll do everything in my power. Uh, this is the end of Cody's story. Well, that's what Cody wants to do is finish the story and the start of the Bloodline one for that. The end of Cody's story was halfway clever. I've said all along, as soon as they did this pivot, they're not going to not do, now that he's on the board, Rock versus Roman. Yeah. But the decision presumably was made, we need to do this when everyone's sort of like unanimously on board with this idea. We can't have it hijacked. It can't be bittersweet. It's too big to be bittersweet. And, you know, we can pay off a two-year story in the meantime. Yeah. And, you know, have our cake and eat it too. So as soon as the pivot happened... I always thought Rock and Roman are going to have some tension on the night one tag, and then it's going to blow up. So the clues exist for a reason. Maybe Rock is, in fact, playing the long game. I mean, it's his words, the foreshadowing and the all L the rest up, of it. The L going up might be, he might have actually watched some of it <laughs> on YouTube. On YouTube. He's not watching Fox for two hours. He's just watching us. Yeah, he's, he's on the, the board and he can't do the, the bloodline. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was an L or whatever. Maybe he's doing some long game subtle stuff. Um, either way, like, but I've said, I said that two weeks ago because even before it was heavily hinted that, yeah, the Rock and it's not really aligned with Roman's interests and he's probably not really in the bloodline. Even before Friday, I was of the opinion they're going to fall out in the tag and Rock might even cost Roman. I just hope that if there's an interference, there's a little bit of back and forth between Cody and Roman after that interference so you can tell the story that Rock's turned on Roman mm -hmm. and that they're going to have a match at WrestleMania 41, but I don't want it left in any doubt that Cody was the better man on the night I don't yeah. want Rock to be the difference maker. I want him to... He can interfere. I, I, or he can neutralize the interference of Solo and Jimmy. I don't want him to ref bump, rock bottom, oh, pick you up, crossroads, because yeah. then it's like the Rock's one. Yeah. That's what I don't want out of this. It's it's Wilborn's finish that you do the like for like solo yet again is in the corner, but not this time. The Rock's, you know, like the Rock's regained his sense of justice for all of this as a result. So of he takes action. solo out, allowing Cody to beat Roman fair and square by himself. Yeah. 
and then Roman, I have to get that right. Roman can reflect then on how involved The Rock was in stopping his master plan. With yeah, him. his master plan, which by the way is just getting people to interfere for him, and it's worked for like four years at this point. Aye. But like, but nonetheless, a master plan in inverted commas. Um, yeah, I think ultimately The Rock. It, to your, you know, to your analysis of that, there was a lot to do. He didn't do all of it, but I am. I, w- I was definitely leaning in again. I think The Rock has got more material to mine as a heel. I think this it was hardly subtle. He's wearing a frigging Versace shirt with the sleeves cut off. But there are elements where he can get funnier and sillier as a heel character, more grandiose and more believing himself to be like the high chief of the bloodline or whatever yeah. it is. That Even then Roman on camera, it's like, all right, mate. Like, don't forget the tribal chief is. So you get you build that tension a little bit. There is more for The Rock to do. And there I think is. that he didn't just give it all. I don't know how many Smackdowns they're going to do, but he didn't give it all away straight away. I wanted to be a heel for a while before yeah. WrestleMania, then do the tension in the match on mm. night one because heel rock's too entertaining. We talk about trailer park trash, nostalgia, fatties, nostalgia. The vest gave us nostalgia for a period of my life when someone who I used to know, don't know him anymore, when we all had the dragon... Shirts from Top Man in the UK. Great times. That looked vaguely adjacent to what The Rock would wear on TV. Yep. Uh, once did it unbuttoned and walked around <laughs> because he wanted to be The Rock. Like that. Please find me a picture of that. It was pre-smartphones. Pre- but you know, you know how old we are. I know, yeah. Thank God for that. <laughs> but, um, right, we'll do a few questions and then we'll wrap up here. Uh, question first from uh, Steve Nicola Pillar, Edward Shiraz Hands. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm not Wilborn. Can't do your name. Uh, but I'm not going to do your accent either, so we'll call this a score draw. Uh, good day, Dr. Fed, Dr. Elite, and I'm sorry, Nicholas, Dr. NXT. Yeah. Uh, which gimmick, give us the usage, which gimmick would you pair with uh, which wrestler? Bret Hart would be a great Bastion Booger. Also, what literal line wait, would Wait, 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 wait. What? Which gimmick would you pair with which wrestler? So he says... He's a good hit, man. I know that. Bret Hart would be a great Bastion Booger. So I don't quite know what he's getting at there. Like, is it because he's just so gruff with everything these days? Like present day Bret Hart? I don't know. Is he just wanting to bring... Oh, that means. Sorry, Edward Trasser. Yeah. Take two completely out there gimmicks and then put them together. Oh, it's like a crap gimmick with a great wrestler. Yeah. To see if they can be salvaged. Or vice versa. A great gimmick with a terrible wrestler. Ooh. Um, I would like to see... Um, well, what would I like to see? <laughs> it is. It's literally the question. I can't answer it. Can you, Megan? Just... Kenny Omega to be the Mountie. <gasps> I love it. I bloody love it. Canadian. Uh-huh. Get NXT. one of those sticks. We've just booked NXT Kenny Omega. Oh, Kenny Omega with a shock stick. Oh. And the little trigger's got a V on it. Kenny does it the next time he faces Moxie and there's law with Moxie dressed as a Mountie as well, isn't there? Yes. And there's law with explosions oh and electricity. God. Oh, my God. Finally, have that match we've been waiting for them to have. Actually, the cage match was pretty good. Yeah. Kenny Omega. I liked all of them. I love that. He's also said, uh, what literal line would you give Von Wagner next? So either a bit of patter or, I guess, like a fishing line. He could be a fisherman. We've had fishing stories on NXT before. Remember when Bron Brick went out on that boat? Like, we've had a fishing. Yeah, 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 yeah. What literal line would you give uh, Like What line of work? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Von Wagner. <laughs> Von Wagner, what could he take literally? Um, a pinfall, but I was already lying down. We could fold Kenny Omega back in. Anyway. Cleaner, but I, I just polished the Hoover. <laughs> I but thought I, I was a wrestler. But I barely know her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see. God, Matt Reigns has been on. He's paid for this. I have to read it. Uh, good afternoon, gents. King, please don't lose any more respect for me. What? Matt Reigns is in. Matt Reigns is in. King, please don't lose any respect for me. I bought tickets to Sand and Deliver last night. And then he wants you to do the uh, adamant noise that Wilborn does. Oi, oi, oi. Thank you. Big question here. Uh, oh, right. We can go to the next day if you want. You, you have- <laughs> You've been given the King's pardon for going You've to NXT. You've been given the King's pardon. Well... Big question here. Where we, he's definitely not including me in this, where are we going for cheesecakes? My treat. Didn't you get given... I've got, I've not been for, I do have, I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> I've got loads of work to do. The, the, 
other side of these trips is, right, you get this, like, you wake up, eat normal time. You, like, do whatever. Eat your one meal that you should have in America. <laughs> and then you go to the show. Yep. And then everyone else gets, oh, what a great show. <sighs> Try time to hit the hay. Got to like, do, like, a 10-point list in a, <laughs> in a podcast after that. I mean, I've got to do it. Oh, this job. Um... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we did get some intel on G6. Thanks, everybody. When we've been putting the requests out, people have been coming in with a bunch of links, haven't they? I can't remember the names of any, but they're all in my bookmark like, yes. tweets for the weeks to come. Because, like, I love that Let's as bring well. Bring one to the show. I, I love that there's obviously, there's going to be some rubbish ones. But if you're from Philadelphia or around area, there's probably your favourite, but there's going to be 15 other. Yeah. Best cheesesteaks in town. It's like, well, we're there for like six days, so we can get six of them. <laughs> Thought Adam. Yeah. 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 Oh, we do. It's from Dean Sheets. He's going to ask us the last question today, and then we'll get out of here. Hi, Dean. Hi, Dean. Hi, Dean. What would you call, people love this, and you kind of hate it, actually, so I love that we've got this question. What would you call this era of wrestling? Because remember, Sige, when we were kids and we were watching Hogan Warrior, we sat there as like five, six-year-olds and went, I love the, uh, the golden era. This of, is the uh, golden age for me. Uh, this is much better than uh, Londos and Haki <laughs> Schmidt uh, and Harley Race. This is better. This is the golden era. New generation, to be absolutely fair, they did beat you over there with every yeah, five yeah. seconds because they were desperate to say, Hogan, he's frigging ancient, actually. You want our young guys like Randy Savage. Uh, you want our young guys like Roddy Piper. Right, like young studs. So new generation, new generation. Then we had the Attitude Era. I don't know if you remember that one. That really comes up. Then, and this is kind of my favorite, actually. Definitely not just for two weeks and then never mentioned again. We had the ruthless aggression era. Don't, don't, don't you start. The goated era, IMO. We How could it last? We need to talk more about the ruthless Six aggression Six years. Era. Got its own documentary series. When they said it for two weeks? Two seasons of a documentary series about how uh, we had to change the name from Federation to Entertainment because it was too goddamn entertaining. Remember that? Yeah. That's why they got the F out. Yeah, I do remember this. Ruthless aggression. PG. PG. My least favourite. The reality, reality era. era. What the hell is that? Uh, reality era. What was after that? Network, I think. Aye. Which I get. 2014, death of pay-per-view. It kind of does change a little bit about like, uh, like got, the... You just got more crap, basically. More super served crap. Uh, super served crap era. I would say sort of 2017 onwards to 2022. Absolute worst. This is rock bottom. We're never recovering. Like, he needs to die in that chair because get him out, it's as bad as it gets. This is like the... So what we're in now, I would say July 2022 to present is a... You can make the argument that this rock thing's a new era still. Yeah, I suppose. Well, unless we thought, like, could it be the bloodline era? The cinema era. People do call... People have called it that a number of times. Uh, can't find it, but yeah. It's the Triple H era because it's very it? much it post is, Vince. The Triple H era. Um, and it might not last forever. We keep talking about this. Yeah. He might just get replaced when he, when he sucks. I can't think of anything snappy on the spot. These are the kind of things that get like mind mapped in big meetings. It, like I could see them all caps, the story era. The story like, as era. suggests that all of these great stories have meant that finally like the Fed became the story. It's called a friggin'. I don't, like, do you know what has happened? In a, uh, we heard, we say these words on the forums and then in early days wrestling Twitter that I just thought it's never, ever happening again. We actually had a new boom. Remember new boom period? So-and-so will turn heel, new boom period. Yeah, so -so yeah. maybe new boom period. It's actually occurred, hasn't it? We're in a new, new boom. boom. So Maybe new boom. Maybe new boom. Very worried it's going to end at WrestleMania, actually. Uh, uh, there's a peak of it. Peak I've of got it. no cares about that at all. That's okay, because we've come to the peak of the SmackDown podcast. So let's call it here, Sitch. Thank you very much for joining us, for leaving your questions beforehand today. And for listening and viewing on YouTube and all that sort of good stuff. If you want to catch us on X, you can do. I've got all the questions. At what culture list. WWE. Thank you very much. At what culture WWE. You can also find Michael Sidgwick at M Sidgwick. You can get me at Michael Anthony. You can get our brilliant producer, Adam Nicholas, at It's Adam Nicholas. Uh, we've got our raw preview that is already on the podcast feeds as you listen to this. And until next time, we will see you soon. <laughs>